very excited to be um, at this conference. I've looked forward to it for, for quite a while. And uh, Nixon and I go back way, way, way back, as way back as 95, 96. You know, we actually studied media together in Cape Town and, uh, and uh, just to see what God has been doing in his life and through his life is very inspirational. I take him as a brother indeed. And so uh, when he shared the vision of Elevate and what God is doing here, I was one of the most excited people and I still am. And so I count it a privilege to be here uh, with the other men of God. Uh, Apostle, thank you so much for coming this far. And the other men of God that have also traveled and that are with us here today, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I wanted to allow me this morning to speak uh, freely and um, yeah, and, and, and just speak some, some, some truth, you know, to us on this subject of uh, building value for kingdom financiers. And um, uh, I've, 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 I've entitled my presentation a progressive thesis on the concept of value. This concept of value. I'm not talking values. I'm talking value as a concept uh, that I feel that the church uh, can benefit from. Why? Because there is a lot of uh, uh, giving fatigue. I'm sure you've been uh, following just the global trends in the, in the, in the, in the, both in the marketplace and also in the church. There has been an attack on the church in terms of the area of giving and tithing. And there's been quite a lot of controversy. I think a lot of the stuff that's going out there, um, there are people who are zealous but are knowledgeable. And so, um, and the worst thing about the 21st century um, is of course uh, the fact that everyone has access to some form of media and that gives you a voice. And so it's very easy to confuse people without giving them solutions. And, um, and, um, and I think uh, it's, a, it's, um, it's, an, it's an attack on the body of Christ. But it's also, remember, every form of crisis always uh, brings about a bigger blessing. You know, I remember the, the, Wall, uh, the Wall Street crash in 1928 birthed some amazing uh, organizations and companies in the U.S. I mean, you had, to, you, you had your Bank of America and a lot of uh, uh, great companies coming out of that and standing out of that. And so... I believe that the current crisis against the church will birth a lot in us in terms of how we evolve, in terms of how we innovate, in terms of how we make sure that the work of God goes forward. And so I want to speak specifically uh, uh, to these. And um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a personal development uh, uh, expert or consultant, I, I, I always value distilling the problem down to the individual. You see, because we always say the nation uh, has corrupt leadership. So, but the, the nation has corrupt leaders because it has a problem in, 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 in families. And it has a problem in families because it has a problem in individuals. So if you can fix the individual, you can solve the team. I think that's always the thing. One young boy was, uh, was given a task of putting together a puzzle, a very challenging puzzle. And what this young man did, uh, this boy, it was a big challenging puzzle. Now something interesting happens is that uh, within two minutes, two minutes he had solved the puzzle. And so the teacher is like, what? You are only six years old and you've solved a puzzle that baffles people all the way into their 50s and 60s. How did you do it? The boy said, look, I simply turned the page around and there's the picture of a man. <laughs> I realize that if I can put the men together, the other side also, also, also comes into context, you see. And so, and so I think our biggest challenge is always our worldview and how we apply that worldview into what we are doing. So, so allow me to zero in not just on ideas on how the church can innovate financially, but also on the mindset that pretty much determines how we react and respond and how we frame our, our finance models within the church. I want, to, I want us to read um, as, I, as I get going uh, on the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and I'll read from verse 13 to 18. Verse 13 to 18. I'm speaking on the issue of, the, of value. Developing a value proposition. Understanding this concept of value in a very progressive sense. 
you know um, let's read there the Bible says um, this wisdom I have seen under the Sun and it seemed great to me there was a little city with a few men in it and a great king came against it and besieged it building great snares around it now there was found in it a poor wise man and he by his wisdom delivered the city Yet no one remembered that same poor man. Now, the scriptures here give us a very interesting uh, um, um, insight into, into, into what happens in the context uh, uh, um, as, the, as the writer tells the story. He says there is a, there is a, 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 a poor wise man, right, who is in a place where he is in the context of a city that is under siege. So there is a government under siege. There is a city under siege from a much stronger and a much bigger king. But then the Bible says this poor wise man, by his wisdom, delivers the city. But because he's a poor wise man, nobody remembers him. You see, right there, I start having a challenge because I want to say to you that value is a language. This concept of value, right, right. I, 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 I've got a phrase I've coined. I always say poverty is not the absence of money, but the failure to speak the language of value in the marketplace. You see, a poor man is not a man without a dime in his pocket. He's a man who cannot speak value. He's a man who cannot package his gift in a language of value. He's a man who cannot package his vision in a language of value. People will overlook what you do if there is no value perception to it. So now, so now, so now, this wise man, my question uh, as, I, as I build my case here, as I build my thesis, is, is what was the issue? Why is he poor when he is wise? Why is he poor when he is wise? Is it perhaps the fact that we have never looked at the fact that his wisdom could have been packaged in a language of value to bring an income to him. Right, let me go a bit further into it. He has a unique skill that no one else can do. The city is under siege. They have a problem and he's the only one who can provide a solution. Now, this is the issue. Why is he poor when he is wise? Why are we poor when we are wise? Right. Is the issue, number one, was it a problem with his gift? Is it that his gift was not operational? No. His gift was very operational. The Bible tells us that by his wisdom, he what? He saved a city. So his gift was very operational. His gift was, 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 was flowing. I mean, it was, it was at optimum levels. Secondly, was the problem the size of the challenge? No. Even though the Bible says there was a bigger king that came against this city and built snares and bulwarks and, uh, and said, I am going to take over this city. It seemed like a big challenge, but the poor man's problem was not the size of the challenge because the Bible says he was able to bring a solution. So what was his issue? Was the problem the inability of the king to pay him? No, not at all. He's dealing with a city, he's dealing with a budget in a city. And remember, a king under duress like this could pretty much, you could name your prize and he would pay it. So what, why is this guy poor when he's wise? And yet he's got a gift that can generate an income for him. His problem is that he did not know how to speak a language of value. He did not know how to package the value he was carrying in a way that people could support. So he solves the problem and then he asks for 10 rand to go home. He's like, ah, I've solved your problem. You, your kingdom is back, guys. Anyone with 10 rand here because I just want to catch a ride home and maybe buy a loaf of bread. That's how we are if we don't understand that value is a language. Success, success 
in business success in ministry is about understanding that value is a language and how you package that value and how you communicate that value can bring a return back into your ministry it can bring a return back into your life so let me speak about value what is value what is the definition of value value is the amount of money that something is worth it is the price or cost of something that's number one. Secondly, value is a fair return or equivalent in goods, services, or money for something exchanged. Three, value speaks to relative worth, utility, or importance. Of course, four, value is the aggregate properties of something that make it worthwhile in the eyes of another. So now, 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 we've got to understand that value is a property. That can be applied to anything that we do. And I think we've got to begin to evolve for ourselves as, as, as ministers and people that work within the concept of the gospel. What, how am I packaging what I'm doing in a language of value? It's not a shortage of partners. It's not a shortage of supporters. It's not a shortage of people that can finance the kingdom. But there is something wrong with how we are communicating value. Right, let me talk about the key concepts of value. There are two types of value. The first type of value is what I call intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is, is a, a, anything alive has intrinsic value. It's value you are born with. As a human being, you are born valuable. The moment you show up from conception, or the, the, as long as you are a human being, you are valuable. So, for example, no one can just kill you for, you know, and, and then act like they didn't kill you. Why? Because as a human being, you are valuable. So there is what we call intrinsic value that a human being is born with. And then secondly, we've got what is called assimilated value. Now, assimilated value is value that you acquire, you develop a skill, you, you birth a vision, you push it, and, and, and you, 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 you add value to yourself. I've got a, a few academic titles to my name but I was not born with them I had to go to school I had to learn some skills that added a dimension of value to me so much that now when I do a service it's worth a certain amount of money because I have developed I have assimilated value now, 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 we also have to understand some things concerning value, and I'll bring it back to the church, I think, as, as I'm closing. Understand that when you have assimilated value, and when you put value on yourself, the first thing you need to know is that the world does not pay for your time, it pays for your value. Understand that. Why? Because a poor man's one hour is the same as a rich man's one hour. A poor man's 24 hours is the same as a rich man's 24 hours. If we were paid from the amount of time we put into something, we would all earn the same. But one man's hour is worth a hundred rand and an hour to another man is worth a thousand dollars. Why the difference? The difference is not the amount of time. The difference is the value. Is the value that you put into it. I remember one engineer came to fix a machine that an organization couldn't get to figure out. And so, and so the guy came, looked around, apparently took a hammer and knocked once in a certain place and they sent him a bill for a thousand dollars. He says, you, 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 you know, they, and then he sent the owners a bill for a thousand bucks. The guy said, no, no, no. You walked around here, looked around, and then you only did one tap and then you charge us a thousand bucks. What's your problem? So he sends back an explanation, a breakdown of the invoice. He says, look, for tapping, I'll charge you a dollar. But for knowing where to tap, it's 999. You see, because this guy had added value into his life and he knew how to unlock certain dimensions of financial income. It's very critical that we understand the world does not pay you for your time. It pays you for your value. You want to make more money, add some value into your life. You know, it's interesting that Floyd Mayweather did his, his just his last recent fight. And that fight, I, I, I watched it in the morning, like, like what? Like, like 5, 4.35 in the morning. It lasted for 28 minutes and he walked out away with over $400 million for 28 minutes of work. 400 million American dollars. And my question is why? Because some people work for a whole month and they don't manage to make a thousand. It's value. 
value, 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 value. The church needs to understand this message of value. Secondly, where value is not known, where you don't know the value and you can't speak the language of value, abuse is inevitable. I remember some years back, I used to be, I used to be uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in media, and, um, and, and I remember speaking to one gentleman that had been uh, involved with the whole process. Uh, uh, I think in 2006 or so, diamonds were discovered in Zimbabwe. And, 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 and they said this is one of the biggest finds at that time. They said it's one of the biggest finds because the diamonds are alluvial. You know, alluvial diamonds, it means they are on the surface. You, you don't need to sweat too much. So now I speak to the guy who had a prospecting license uh, for, the, for the previous three years before the whole thing exploded. And then he says to me, I say to him, what is the story with those diamonds? He says, no, look, the issue is that those diamonds, were, were, the chiefs knew that they were there. And the boys who used to hate cattle knew that there were these funny stones that had these interesting shapes. But what the boys would do, they did not understand the value of what was there. So they would literally take those, go pick those stones and put them in catapults and they would use them for hitting birds. Can you imagine that? And so he says, he says, he says for three years that's what was happening. And imagine one of those diamonds my God, that's two million dollars. One of those stones, and a guy takes it, puts it in a catapult, and throws it at birds. Imagine you are a bird, like, oh, oh, two million missed me. Oh, another hundred thousand, another twenty thousand. Why? Because where value is not known, abuse is inevitable. Some of those guys will die poor. Why? Because they held millions and just did not understand the value of what they had in their hands. Hey, value is something that you can apply to make your life better. If you don't know the value of what you have, you will abuse it. You will not, you will not appropriate to it what is needed. It's important that we understand value. Number three, value works on the principle of perception. It's driven by a, 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 an agent called perception. You see, it's valuable because the people perceive that it's valuable. I was talking this morning and looking at some prices and I saw some Burberry shoes uh, for 12,000 rands. Like, like these are sneakers for 12,000 rands. And, and I said to myself, do they talk? They said, no, they don't talk. <laughs> I said, if I step on a chewing gum, will it, will, will it stick to, my, to, uh, to the sole of the shoe? A, a, a 12,000 rand sneaker should be able to reject chewing gum when you step on it. They said, no, it doesn't reject chewing gum. I said, but are people buying these kinds of shoes and sneakers? They said, yes, they are able to keep their value in the marketplace because we've created a perception that they are worth that much. So people come from all over the the world and they buy and they order these shoes and they look good and walk in them whether they talk or whether they stick gum underneath them is another discussion for another day but they are able to get what they need out of it because they have created a value perception for it that's the power of value when you've got something that you can package make sure that you pitch to win Package it in a language of value. The problem is that we've packaged church uh, 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 from, from an apologetic point of view. Even when we ask, uh, sorry guys, we are a church, uh, we want some donations, please make, uh, just give us a cheap price because we are a church. We have totally devalued the perception of church in society, in community, and no wonder we are in a fatigue at the moment. We don't understand the perception of value that you create. It determines how much you get paid. It determines what comes in. So let me talk to you about dimensions of value, right? Dimensions of value because value has, 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 has dimensions. It's got concepts and it's got dimensions, right? The first, the first uh, 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 um, uh, a point of, uh, of, um, of, 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 uh, that I want to speak about is one dimension of value is what is called rational value, which is cerebral value, logical value. Now, this speaks to the fact that a Mercedes will cost more than a, a Toyota Tez, right? 
So, 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 if I drive up and I and I and I and I, and I park my Mercedes here, and, uh, and and another guy comes and parks his tears there, and we are both filling up petrol, right? It it is reasonable that uh, the attendant will expect a better tip from me driving a Mercedes than he will expect from the guy driving a tears. Whether we've got that money is another story, but the point is that it it, it is logical that the Mercedes will cost more than the tens. It is logical that the guy who comes out of the Mercedes should have a bit more value about the guy with the tens. Maybe the guy with the tens has, passed, has parked a Maserati at home. That's another discussion. <laughs> but the point is that value is rational. You have rational dimensions of value, right? Secondly, we've got what is called irrational or emotional value. Now, this is very interesting because I know in the church we've sort of used that very well. Now, the value is not based on reason, but rather it's based on emotion. For example, the moment you walk into a gallery and they tell you that this painting was done by Leonardo da Vinci, already you know that it has moved from logic to emotion. It has moved from rational to irrational value. The glove that Michael Jackson wore, was it 1983 or so when he was doing Thriller? Someone bought that glove for $400,000. And my question is, what does the glove have to do with anything? Elvis Presley's shirt was bought for thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands. And the question is, well, it's a shirt. Why? Because you have rational value, but you also have irrational value. So you need to understand what is the value language that the marketplace is speaking so that I can speak to that dimension of value. If you bring logic where the value language is irrational, you will not get your value. If you bring irrational value where there is a logical platform, you will not get it. So you've got to understand the language that the marketplace is speaking. The third one is what I call self-interest or political value, where, where you relate because it can advance you, it can advance what, what you do. And so, and so it's very important that as the church, we begin to evolve models that speak to the value languages and that are packaged in languages of value to the people that we are speaking to. And so, and so, and so I know, I know, I know my time is gone. Let me just uh, uh, bring it all together. What are some of the solutions that we need to do in terms as far as the church is concerned? We've got to number one, uh, because remember, remember the vision that God has given us will not necessarily be financed through tithes and offerings. Some visions are bigger than tithes and offerings. Right, I mean, I mean, Elevate TV is bigger than tithes and offerings. So, so, so we've got to, to, to evolve certain uh, languages and, and understand how we can then package that and, uh, and, uh, and build value for the kingdom of God. You, you see, I, I always say spirit and strategy can coexist. See, the problem is that in the church we've got too much spirit and no strategy. It's very important that sometimes, you know, spirit and strategy must coexist. The plan of salvation is God working out a strategy. Christ coming in the in the in Gethsemane, he's he's, he's, he's he's distraught, an angel comes, and all of that is divine strategy working out. Therefore, in ministry, strategy is your friend. Right. Number one, we need to change our language of value in the church and in how we fundraise and in how we, we, we pretty much communicate our vision to people. Move away a lot from what I call irrational to logical value. And I will explain what I mean because I don't want a discussion on what's spiritual and what's not. But, 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 but for example, let me, let me qualify what I'm saying. We need to teach things right. Number one, we teach responsibility ahead of generosity. When you, when you look at the funding model of the church, it's based on generosity. So we stand up and we say, we need to be generous givers. We need to be, God loves a cheerful giver and a cheerful giver is a generous giver. There is nothing wrong with that, with that model of teaching. The challenge is that you cannot teach generosity before you teach responsibility. Okay, for example, 
I have a family. My question is, if I, for example, uh, 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 pay for the light, am I being responsible or am I being generous? Am I being responsible or am I being generous? Responsible. If I buy groceries for my home, am I being responsible or am I being generous? Should I be applauded and say, oh, dad is so generous, he bought bread for us this morning. If I pay the water and, and, and I make sure that there is fuel in the car to take the kids to school, am I being responsible or am I being generous? I'm being responsible. You see, in the church we have not taught responsibility, but we've taught generosity. Now the problem is that we are expecting irresponsible people to be generous. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. We need to first of all teach responsibility to say this is a house. When you tithe, you are being responsible. You are not being generous. Come on, somebody. When, you, when we make sure that the needs of the house, the needs of the ministry elevator are taken care of, that's not generosity. That's responsibility. But you can't expect irresponsible people to be generous. Believe me, they will hold you by the neck and they will say you are taking their money, this and that. Because you've never taught them to be responsible. If everybody in the church, by the way, when you look at the statistics, Pastor, what? 10% of the, of the church tithe and they carry the other 90%. See, it doesn't make sense. Why? It's because we don't have responsible people. But we don't teach the right thing as pastors. So we come and we go for the emotional side and say, you've got to be generous because God wants a, gener a, a, a generous giver. And yet we can't even pay the bare minimum. I, I remember speaking to one of my mentors in the US and he was telling me that every year 10,000 churches close doors. Why would 10,000 churches close doors? It's because they, the pastors are fatigued. Because we are telling people to be generous and they are irresponsible. They will never get to the level of generosity because they are, they are still irresponsible on basic needs. Let's teach it right. Let's teach it right. So we've got to change our value language and teach things right. Secondly, we've got to embrace excellence as a language of value. It's very critical. You see, because, because, because excellence is what helps, is what creates a value perception. There are some organizations that when you walk into the excellence that there speaks to the fact that these people are at this level. See, a lot of times we don't have excellence. We do not have excellence. And we are afraid to combine spirit and strategy. And that alone is a failure of excellence. It's not that we don't have great ideas, but we don't know how to be excellent about those ideas. Don't be afraid, men of God, to outsource uh, professionals and get good value even outside of the church walls. See, I write books, I'm an author. But one of the key challenges I have whenever I speak to publishers and people that help people publish is that we pastors are bad writers. We are terrible. If if our book was to stand out there, no one outside your church or my church would buy them because we are poor writers. And so therefore, we, we put pressure on people to buy the book that is not excellent in its cover design, it's not excellent in its concepts inside, it's not excellent in how it's typewritten, it's not excellent in its marketing strategy. We just produce and then we think that wealth comes from being productive. No, wealth comes from multiplication and multiplication is dependent on value perception. Wealth does not come from, from a prototype. It comes from multiplication. We've got to be excellent. Make sure, bring in the right people to, to work with you on strategizing on how you can take things forward. Very important. Get a designer. Get a typesetter. Get an editor. And, and look at what the standard out there is so that we can exceed it as the church. I love the excellence of Elevate. You know, even when I'm standing here, you look at the branding. It, 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 it speaks to the, the, the fourth industrial revolution. That's where we live in. Industry 4.0. Everything is cutting edge. So when there's a value going out, you can look at it and say, it is worth it. 
it is worth it. So we, we, we have to be excellent both in content and in aesthetics. Let's bump up our language of value there. So that when you communicate vision, as the man of God said, that people don't give to need, they give to vision. But how you package your vision is very important. It's very important because it's a value language. For example, look at David, right? David wants to pitch for a job to go and fight Goliath. How does he pitch for, how does he package himself to Saul? He says, you know what? I have killed a what? A bear. That's over 600 pounds of fury even on a bad day. He says, I've killed a lion. That's Panthera Leo. That's over 400 pounds. That's the king of the jungle. When he roars, other animals shrink because the king of the jungle has roared. And so if he packages himself as a guy who's killed both a bear and a lion, Saul standing here says, you know what? I need a guy to kill a giant. Probably this guy has a point. Why? Because he's able to package himself in a language of value that makes sense to his marketplace. And then later on, when, when, when King Saul has a demon, does David show up as a guy who killed a lion, as a, as a lion killer and a giant slayer? No, he shows up as a what? As a worshiper. The value proposition has changed. One guy who was a giant killer in that situation is a worshiper in this situation because he understands the dimensions and this concept of value. Come on, somebody. If you don't know that, you will not get what you are worth in the marketplace because you will become a, 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 a square peg in a round hole. And we have packaged the church wrongly because we have packaged ourselves wrongly. I call every pastor to go back to excellence. Make sure your ministry is excellently run. Make sure the value you are asking people to, uh, to, to give into or to, or to partner you with is worthy. It's worthy of what you are putting out there, of the perception that you are putting out there. And of course, lastly, I want to say, create logical and new avenues of value. This is very important to me. I remember uh, some, some, um, some years ago, I, 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 um, I was in the United States, and my young brother lives in the U.S. He got sick. And when he got sick, he was taken to a, a, a hospital. You know, it was, he was in the ICU for a couple of days. So I go and I visit reward in hospital. Man, great facility, amazing facility. You know, and uh, this doctor, 25-year-old guy, man, you know, everything was just functional. So they, they, they patch him up and, 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 uh, 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 and he's okay. So when he's coming out of the hospital, I walk out, right? I walk out and I look at the name of the hospital and it said Methodist Health System. I said to myself, wow, the Methodists have established a health system. Not only do they have hospitals, they have schools, and you have a lot of these uh, uh, ministries that have established different value uh, uh, areas. And I said, wow, wow, wow. As a church, we need to have new avenues of value. What do we have as Pentecostals except the big car for the pastor and the big house for the pastor? And then we make that the symbol of blessing. See, that's not right. You must create something that will outlive you and create something that people can lock into as an avenue of value. So, so the Methodist health system generates finances for their system because everybody needs medical care. You may be gifted in healing, but believe me, set up a clinic there, that's another avenue of bringing people to your church. We've got to think outside the box, my, my, my dear ministers of the gospel. See, so, so the medical fraternity is one. Secondly, another avenue is education. Very, very critical. I remember speaking to another pastor friend of mine. He's setting up a preschool and, 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 and we were chatting about it. I said, you've got it right. Do you know that parents will sacrifice everything to make sure their kids go to school? And so, even if people who don't believe in your value system will not come and sit in your church, but everybody needs their kid to go somewhere. 
And even in the recession here in South Africa, primary, pre-primary schools and uh, and 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 these and these and these and these and these uh, crashes never went out of business. Why? Because it's a very viable thing. And so I want to challenge you, start looking into some of these avenues. For example, look at, uh, uh, lastly as well, the issue of wealth creation. Wealth creation is a model we need to teach in the church. And the funny thing is that we've got actuaries in our churches, we've got accountants in our churches, we've got investment bankers, and we've got strategies, and yet we don't say anything to them about connecting their gift into wealth creation models for the church. I don't even know three, I probably know one or two churches that have a bank. And yet the banking system is one of the, I mean, here, here in South Africa, you can have a community bank, a community-based bank. It doesn't require too much in terms of, even in terms of legislation. But the point is, once you have that, you have a system where you can now help people create a generational wealth model through investment there. But we don't think of that. We don't think of the Christian uh, 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 base as a base that can actually uh, be, be, uh, be activated in terms of solid value propositions. Let's try to think and let's start thinking differently. I mean, the area of education, I remember the other day I was saying that the Ivy League schools do the studies. The Ivy League schools in the U.S. were started by churches. I'm talking your Yale and your Harvard and, and your Ivy League schools. It was the church that realized that, you know what, we cannot just impact someone spiritually, but let's, uh, let's, let's have a holistic approach to men. And then somewhere, 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 we moved to the fringes and we lost our ability to speak the language of value. And if I've said anything today, my point to us is that we need to get back to understanding this concept of value. Package your vision in a language of value. Generate causes that are valuable that people can plug into. You see, your own emotional need is not a cause. No. A cause is what you can lock people into and once they see what you saw, they own it and they run with it the same way you run with it. So you've got to duplicate yourself and your ability to grasp vision and communicate it in a language of value to the people that, that follow us. I think as a church, we've got to pull up our socks in that regard. And I am very, very grateful that I think as we begin to do this, we are living in the fourth industrial revolution. Things have changed. Make sure that you are up to date with everything that's going on out there. Understand the power of social media. Understand the power of technology. Understand everything that's coming so that you are ahead and your value proposition is ahead. So that when you are preaching your message, it will speak to the heart of men, but it will also speak to the mind of men. Thank you so much. May God bless us.